a kid who tries in eighth grade has fairly significant risk of having substance use disorder during their lifetime. If you wait until 10th grade, it goes down by a lot. And if you wait until 18, it goes down by a heck of a lot. So it, with every year that passes without introducing drugs and alcohol to the brain, the risk for lifetime risk for substance use disorder goes way down. Hello and welcome to the Sunshine Parenting Podcast, where each week we talk about ideas for raising kids who become thriving adults. I'm your host, Audrey Monkey. Here on the podcast, I share my experiences raising five kids who currently range in age from 16 to 26 and working with thousands more as a summer camp director over the past three decades. I'm the author of Happy Campers, and I frequently do workshops with parents, teachers, and summer camp professionals about social skills, connection, and happiness, topics I researched extensively for my master's in psychology. If you want tools for raising kind, optimistic, self-reliant kids who become thriving adults, you've come to the right place. Hey listeners, welcome to episode 169, which is first being released on Friday, April 2nd, 2021. I am thrilled to bring you my chat this week with Jessica Leahy. Jessica Leahy is the best-selling author of The Gift of Failure, How the Best Parents Learn to Let Go So Their Children Can Succeed. I last chatted with Jess on the podcast back in episode 43, and this time I am talking with Jess about her brand new book, The Addiction Inoculation, Raising Healthy Kids in a Culture of Dependence. If you don't already know about Jessica Leahy, Jess is a teacher, writer, and a mom. Over 20 years, she's taught every grade from 6th to 12th in both public and private schools. She writes about education, parenting, and child welfare for The Atlantic, Vermont Public Radio, The Washington Post, and The New York Times. She's a member of the Amazon Studios Thought Leader Board and wrote the educational curriculum for Amazon Kids, The Stinky and Dirty Show. Jessica earned a BA in Comparative Literature from the University of Massachusetts and a JD with a concentration in Juvenile and Education Law from the University of North Carolina School of Law. Jess lives in Vermont with her husband and two sons. In this week's chat, we talk about her book, The Addiction Inoculation. This is such an important topic that I think most parents don't address until it becomes a problem with their own children when their child is facing addiction. But what's so remarkable at this, about this book is that Jess gives us guidelines for preventing addiction and for understanding more about addiction and why some kids are more susceptible than others. So I hope you enjoy this conversation and learn a lot. I know I learned a lot from this book and from my conversation with Jess. Enjoy this episode. Welcome back to the Sunshine Parenting Podcast, Jess Leahy. Thank you so much. I'm always happy to talk to you. So I am, I can't even tell you how excited I've been to talk to you about your book, The Addiction Inoculation, Raising Healthy Kids in a Culture of Dependence. Um, you kindly sent me an advanced copy, which I read months ago and read in two days. Like I just ripped through it. I was just enthralled with everything. So why don't you first tell my listeners? And and for the <laughs> listeners can't see this, but you have you have little post-it notes stuck in there, oh. which is to an author. I mean, is there anything better than seeing someone has taken your book and put post-it notes in there? Because that just means it's like something resonated. And to me, and then of course, if I'm at like a book signing or something, I'm like, can I see what you underlined? Because that's the coolest thing is to see something that you wrote in your little hovel, you know, in your little hidey hole office is somehow ending up resonating with a person out in the world. And that that alone just means so much to me. Oh, well, I'm so glad you noticed that. And yes, it did resonate. So you are pretty, like people know you, I think mostly from writing The Gift of Failure, which is a phenomenal parenting book. And that's what we spoke about the last time you were on the podcast. But Jess, explain to listeners why you are the ideal person to write this particular <laughs> book. I'm at a very weird confluence of places, which is 
So I think there are dovetails with Gift of Failure and sort of, you know, when you're going to write a second book, there's all this like, oh, what am I going to write about? It's it's just so scary writing a second book. And there were lots and lots of ideas that I tossed to my agent and she was like, mm, no, this isn't this. This isn't anything. <laughs> and suddenly, like all of the things that I've done in my life sort of came together in one idea. In fact, I was on the highway. I had to pull off the side of the highway in order to text my two best friends, my podcast co-hosts, co-hosts and say, this is it. I figured the book out. So I, um, I come from a long line of sort of, there are a lot of alcoholics, there are some drug addicts in there. Um, so I have that genetically. I knew I had that genetically going on and I resisted it for a very, very, very long time, but I still became an alcoholic later on in life, which is sort of an, uh, an odd story. You don't tend to hear that as often. Um, I got sober right about the same time I sold The Gift of Failure, mainly because my life kind of blew up in a very specific way at that point. I now have over seven years, uh, I have seven and a half years of sobriety at this point. But what- Wait, let's stop and celebrate. <laughs> it was, it's, really, it's really cool. And one year in, just about the time that people sort of say, okay, you've got enough sobriety that you can start thinking about how to help other people. Um, one year in, I started teaching. Uh, well, I went to go speak at an adolescent rehab and I realized if they were in that rehab 24 seven, they must have some sort of education program going on. So I very quickly sort of dug around in there and found out that they did. And I became one of their teachers. And so for five years, I taught in an inpatient drug and alcohol rehab for kids. So the big question for me started becoming when the experts out there, capital E experts out there say substance abuse is preventable, what do they mean? And very specifically, what do they mean? And I'm married to a statistician and I have the ability to dig into a lot of research, mainly because I love it. It makes me so happy and really analyze the data and say, you know, this study's crap. This one has some potential. What, what, what does this substance abuse is preventable mean? And especially as the mom of two kids who have this genetic legacy in their bodies. And um, I just wanted to know what can I do? What can't I do? What can I control? What can't I can control? And um, what is bears, what does the evidence bear out? So that's what that, and I did not anticipate, by the way, when I first started writing this book, that it was going to be as much of a memoir as it has become. Um, and I happen to love that intersection of memoir and nonfiction, uh, memoir and research based uh, nonfiction. So um, I'm in my happy place in this book, and I just hope that it resonates with other people. Oh, Jess, it is, it's amazing. And um, it's funny because you say at one point that you were looking for kind of a book to guide you in your path with your children and kind of path forward mm -hmm. and you couldn't find it. So you had to write it. And I love that. Well, that's not to say that there aren't tons of really good prevention books out there. I mean, there are some great books out there. It just didn't get at the very questions I had, which as was, you know, as an educator of 20 years and specifically as an educator of kids who are dealing with substance abuse and have very high risk factors for substance abuse. You know, what is education doing? What can we do in our parenting? What can I do for my own kids? And that sort of confluence of, of things was really important for me to figure out. Well, I, you know, obviously we're not gonna be able to cover all that's in the book, but I think for my listeners, a really good focus today is going to be talking about why this book isn't just for people who are deep in it already. Mm -hmm. um, I think, I know all of us know parents who have tried to navigate Right. They're addicted children. Right. What do you do? It's really, really hard when you're getting to the point where they're needing medical intervention, they're needing mm -hmm. to go to the rehab. Um, you know, that is really scary for parents. And I think most parents would say they never expected to mm -hmm. be there. Right. So what I'd like to kind of focus on today is just kind of some information to help parents understand why they really need to read this book, even mm -hmm. if... Sorry, my are dogs dog. are my dogs are barking at squirrels, and so I'm trying to quietly squirrel proof my space so that they can yeah, not it's bark fine. Uh, we we have a uh, background noise is uh, is par for the course here with my four actually, dogs that I, I have, have at my house. I have a, uh, a, a slingshot that has these little wool balls that are about, you know, a, an inch across. And that's my secret stop barking during an interview tool is I slingshot little wool balls in my dogs. 
sucks. <laughs> oh, that's so good. Yeah. That's so good. Well, no, we're real here. It's fine. This is not a formal situation here. We're just chatting, which is what my listeners like. They like, they're like, oh, you're always just chatting with friends. What they don't realize is like, most of these people are my friends. And yeah. so that's why it sounds like, that's why it sounds like I'm chatting with my friends. And your um, friends have three dogs. So your friend yeah, has exactly. three dogs sitting in the room yeah. with her. Yeah. <laughs> For sure. Um, so, so a couple things that I want to cover today, and I do want to really encourage people mm -hmm. to get this book, whether you're a parent, an educator, or you have a family history, which when you say that, I'm thinking whose family doesn't have a history? Like yeah. you say that. And I'm like, I, you, I think you'd be hard pressed to find a family right. that doesn't have some genetic, uh, you know, people in their past. I know I certainly have it in my family. Um, and I know anyway, so, um, a couple of things, first of all, I also want to congratulate you. The memoir part is perhaps the, I'm sure it was the hardest part to write. It's really scary. <laughs> I found myself extremely, the first day of recording the audiobook was the very heavy memoir part and the very heavy brain science part. And I came home from recording that day and just laid down on the bed and passed out for two hours. It was just, I guess I underestimated, you know, I had written it and I thought, oh, this will be fine. But then I sort of underestimate, uh, underestimated, oh wait, this is going out in the world. <laughs> <laughs> this is going to be in other people's hands. Like people will be reading this. It's it's a weird experience. Yeah, but I would say but we have so many great authors, you know, that have really paved the way. I mean, Jenny Lawson has a new book coming out the same day I do, The Blog S, um, and her new book, Broken, is absolutely brilliant. And so every time I sort of need to channel those voices, I tend to think of those people that sort of, you know, real honesty, Glennon and, and Jenny and people like that who have really paved the way for me to be as honest as I need to be in order to get rid of this sort of um, shame and secrecy that tends to hover around substance abuse. And I belong to a bunch of really sort of secret groups on Facebook that have to do with women, especially dealing with substance abuse. And over and over and over again, it's the, I'm so scared. I feel so ashamed. I feel, you know, and that before we can deal with our kids and prevention, we have to sort of banish that shame. And so I feel like the more I talk about it, the more it gives other people license to talk about it and the bravery to talk about it. So I got, I have to just get over it and, uh, and hopefully make it easier for other people. Well, and it's what makes your book so, so good, Jess, is because you first tell that story and honestly, a lot of parts of it will resonate with people in a maybe not so great way. Just even your question. I mean, when you talk about the woman at school walking up to you and saying, oh, I so look forward to my couple glasses of wine every night. Is that, you know, does that make me an alcoholic? And, and that questionnaire that you talk about, there's just so many things that I think will make people stop and think how um, we use substances mm -hmm. to numb something else. And I think that's kind of this underlying thing that really resonated with me is that the, the substance abuse comes often for right. people because of an underlying thing. So what I'd like to talk about, I want to ask you first to just share a little bit about what you found were some kind of personality traits mm -hmm. that, you yeah. know, it doesn't destine you to be an addict, but it makes you more at risk um, because I think that's something that parents need to realize even from a very young age, you can understand some of the traits right. and personalities and uniqueness of your child. So what are, um, let's just talk a little bit about a few of the things that, that parents should kind of be like having their radar up about when thinking about kids and adults who tend to, um, you know, mm -hmm. be, be at risk for addiction. Yeah, so this leads into that conversation about genetics as well. You know, there is no like gene for addiction that if we could just splice it out using CRISPR, you know, technology that suddenly we're going to have, you know, we'll just eliminate that problem. And part of the issue is also that personality traits and genetics establishes personality traits. And some of those personality traits bleed into risk factors for substance abuse. And a lot of this then bleeds into um, cognitive development, especially in adolescence. So it's so hard to single out one aspect of this, like when you talk about personality and, you know, there's, a, the problem is, is there's also a lot of anecdotal evidence, uh, quote evidence, it's not really evidence, it's anecdotal around um, personality. And, you know, over and over and over again, I talk to people who work, especially with children in, in a recovery. And we say, you know, it's, you can sort of look at a group of kids and get to know a group of kids and I, and say, mm, I have a feeling your drug of choice is meth. And I have a feeling your drug of choice is pot. And I have a feeling your drug of choice. But on the other hand, there, you know, 
there isn't great research that says if you have these personality traits, then here's your percentage. It just, this genetics doesn't work that way. Human nature doesn't work that way. The line between nurture and nature doesn't work that way. And it's the reason I had to actually talk about epigenetics in the book, which is the way the stresses that we're exposed to as young children and the good things that we're, expre- that we're exposed to as young children um, change the way our genes actually express in our bodies. And so it's not genetics, but it's also not just about chemicals in the brain. Anyway, so, you know, if you have a kid who just loves to hurl themselves off of high places and doesn't have a sense of fear and loves adrenaline and that sort of thing, would I keep a little bit closer eye? Sure. Mainly because the way kids, and especially in adolescence, because adolescence is a time when kids are really wired for sort of risk and novelty and that kind of thing. And they're going to be seeking those um, those moments when they can boost their dopamine and get some adrenaline rush. Because keep in mind, do, uh, adolescents have lower levels of dopamine in their brains than, um, than adults or young children. It's just a lower baseline level. And so for them, life is kind of boring and you want to have something cool and new and different happen. And, you know, you work at a camp, kids jump off of high things and get up on the roof and do all that kind of stuff. And it's those kids that do it for a couple of different reasons, not just because of the adrenaline, but because of also they're looking for the approval of others and they're seeking to find their self-worth in other people saying, ooh, look what he can do, that kind of stuff. All of those things scare me and not scare me, but concern me enough. I mean, I talk about a kid named Brian in the book that um, really the root of his issue, according to him, was not that he was craving substances from an early age, not that they really triggered some sort of um, need in him, but that they they helped him feel like he belonged within a group of people that he really wanted to belong with. And it wasn't until he had other groups of people that he really wanted to belong with more that his his attraction to drugs and alcohol sort of, um, he was able to get a handle on that. So No, it's not that there are certain personality types where I'd say, oh man, you have a 60% risk. But I will tell you that, you know, genetics is about 50 to 60% of the risk. And then, and this is a terrible analogy and I apologize for it ahead of time, but people refer to genetics as the bullet in the gun and trauma as the trigger. That many of us can have that bullet preloaded in our wiring and yet it's not until something pulls the trigger and sort of kicks it into action. And that, I hate that analogy, but it's actually really apt. And so we talk about 50 to 60% of it being genetics and the rest of it being things, largely things like trauma that really kick that into gear. So as much as I'd love to give you a little table with, per- and, and it's at various points in writing the book, I had these like tables and here's a little quiz and here's what kind of kid you have. And it just doesn't work that way. It's not that simple. Substance abuse is a really complicated picture, which is a reason, the reason that there are so many fighting camps, like the, you know, it's a brain disease, it's a developmental disorder, it's a trauma response. It's, you know, all of these different people have, camps have very specific feelings about what substance abuse or substance use disorder is or isn't. And it's really hard to draw those black and white lines. Right. But yes, I, I totally, yeah. That, and I think with you talk a little bit too about just, um, and I think this is something that I hear from kids and adults, the social anxiety, just to kind of make it easier to be with people and feel like, oh, I can be funnier or somehow feel more comfortable in a place where I don't feel comfortable. So I know that is sometimes for people. Um, one, there's like some protective factors though. I know that like, cause this sounds kind of like, oh no, then everybody's at risk and it's true. Everybody is at risk and it's a huge problem right? Because a lot of people are addicted, even some people who don't realize it and, and some kids very young. That well, and let me just stop you there because I don't want to freak yeah. parents out. I want that this book was not written to freak people out. This book was written to be empowering, even when the information is a little bit scary. I mean, for me, there's lots of information that I found out that was a little bit scary, but at the same time, it was also like, okay, I know that now what do I do with this information? And there are very real things we can do with that information. Oh, my kid is hitting other kids. Um, That's important information for me to know because I need to er intervene early. My kid is having early academic failure. I need to intervene on that because that's, um, you know, my kid is suffering from whatever. So there are I want to, I really want this to be a place of empowerment. And I also want parents to remember that 
lots and lots and lots of kids try drugs and alcohol and have no problem whatsoever. Lots and lots of people. My husband is a regular old, regular, even with genetics. My husband comes from a long line too of alcoholics. And yet my husband is a normal run of the mill person who has a beer every once in a while and can pour out the you know, bit of it that he doesn't really want. And that's cool. So it's really about 10% of us um, that have are wired a little bit differently and um, it becomes a problem. So right off the get go, just because your kid tries some pot does not mean you suddenly have a, a, you know, a pothead on your hands. You have a kid who tried some pot and you have some conversations to have, but it's not like you have recovery, uh, you know, have to send your kid off to a uh, treatment center in your future. Yes. Thank you so much for clarifying that because I think it is true that a lot of kids experiment, but like you talk about in the book, just some kids, it, it hits them differently. And um, it is huh? still doing very real things in their brain too, which is, you yeah. know, there's a big push right now to sort of, you know, uh, uh, Dr. Carl Hart has a new book out um, uh, called uh, Drug Use for Grownups. And his, his thesis is essentially we need to destigmatize this. Adults can use drugs and alcohol with very, at, at low risk with some drugs. Um, and that may be true, but that is not the case with adolescents. It's just not. The adolescent brain is still developing. And so I want to make it really clear that whether or not your kid is going to end up having a problem with drugs and alcohol is one thing, but the fact that drugs and alcohol do very, very real um, short-term and long-term damage in the brain during adolescence is a whole other conversation and really what this book is mainly about. Well, and that's what I, you know, I felt very strongly too, that I think it's, um, it's dangerous to normalize um, alcohol and drug use, you know, went for younger, for uh, young adolescents, um, which I think some parents have done thinking that, well, they're going to do it anyway. So I'm just going to be really casual about it. Uh, when we know that it's very different, how these substances impact their brain. And um, like something that really resonated with me from your book is just like how delaying the use can impact. So talk a little bit about why it's important to try as best we can to yeah. delay the delay, start delay, of delay. Brain. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's really striking. I mean, if, uh, so most of the surveys we have about drug and alcohol use among adolescents, the, the big one that comes out every year called Monitoring the Future really looks at like eighth graders, 10th graders, and 12th graders. So we can have a really good um, sense of what's happening at those age groups. And the, re the, the data that has come out of that has been really useful. So we can see, and also I have to, you know, big shout out to the um, Adverse Childhood Experiences study that was done as a, between the CDC and Kaiser Permanente years ago, because that that research on adverse childhood experience has also really opened the floodgates to for to talk about the things that happen to us when we're little have a very real impact on our mental and physical health throughout our lifetime, including you know strokes and heart attack and all that kind of stuff. So, for a kid that starts drugs uh, that starts taking drugs and alcohol in eighth grade, they have a fairly high risk of be having substance use disorder sometime during their lifetime. Now, here's where things get interesting, because as I said, all of these statistics have confounders that are really weird. Like, well, of course, if someone has access, if someone lives in a family where they would ha have be, it might be more likely they would encounter drugs and alcohol when they're younger. Of course, that means they probably have a higher risk during their lifetime. But all of that aside, a kid who tries in eighth grade has a fairly significant risk of having substance use disorder during their lifetime. If you wait until 10th grade, it goes down by a lot. And if you, if you wait until 18, it goes down by a heck of a lot. So it, with every year that passes without introducing drugs and alcohol to the brain, the risk for lifetime risk for substance use disorder goes way down. And partially that has to do with exposure. Partially that has to do with just sort of developmental stuff, like stuff that you start early, early in your life is sort of more likely to become a part of your life. But it also has to do with the way our brain, where our, where kids' brains are from a developmental perspective. They're there's all kinds of very complex stuff going on there. Synaptogenesis, synapses happening, myelination, the, that fatty sheath getting laid over the neurons. Um, all of that stuff has to happen unimpeded. And there is no like backsies. There's no like, oh, we're 22 now. We should probably go back and take care of that stuff that didn't happen in the brain because it was hijacked by the fact that for example, the kid smoked a lot of pot when he was 16. And by the way, the natural, um, 
cannabinol uh, receptors in our brain are in the hippocampus, which is where a lot of our memory formation happens and where we lay down our emotional memories. And if we mess with that at a certain point, there's no like fixing it later. <laughs> it either happens or it yeah. doesn't. And getting that yeah. frontal lobe online is also one of the big parts of adolescence. And um, and drugs and alcohol do a lot of messing with the lower brain, but they can also mess with our frontal lobe, our, our cortex, which is where sort of the higher order adulting behaviors start to happen, the organization and planning ahead and all that sort of stuff. So and what's interesting about so many drugs, though, is if you just get past, you know, early 20s, because this this cognitive growth and development finishes up somewhere around 24, 25, if you get past that, your risks associated with drugs go way down. Like, there are drugs out there that really don't seem to do much harm to an adult brain, but do massive things to an adolescent brain. So delay, delay, delay. Every day that passes, every month that passes, every year that passes where your kid is not taking drugs and alcohol is protecting their brain for the rest of their life, not only from an intellectual and academic and emotional perspective and a mental health perspective, but from a real, um, in nearly asp every aspect of their life. It's, it's huge to delay. Yeah. Oh gosh. I, I appreciate that so much. And that's been, um, you know, I didn't have your book when my kids were younger, but I will just say that I, I knew that for, for our family, it was going to be, we're, we're following the law, <laughs> you know, yeah. that's our, our expectation is that we're not going to break the law. And right. so, you know, the law, which is funny because we, uh, so the law here is 21, right. Mm -hmm. For alcohol, we were on a trip to Costa Rica mm -hmm. where the drinking age is 18. And so, uh, <laughs> We had a kid who was yeah. over 18. Yeah. Let him have a, a you know, a cocktail at yeah. our dinner and it was really fun for him. And it sounds a little weird because it's like, what are you doing? But yeah, it's at arbitrary. the same time, yeah, we yeah. were like, we're gonna, we're gonna just gonna follow the law. Right. And I like um, there's a part where you talk about the research about children raised in families with permissive drug and alcohol mm -hmm. expectations, which you talk about just kind of like, oh, allowing for sips mm -hmm. and kind of experimentation. And, oh. and I was one, I mean, I think that's really important to remember. Like my poor kids, my younger kid, he's like, this is so unfair because before you knew all this stuff, my older brother got Ben got to have sips of things. He got to try things. I, I copped to the fact that when Ben was an infant, we, someone sent us this just exorbitant bottle of wine, a, a, a wine called Chateau Yquem. And it was, we, I put my finger in it and I put it in Ben's mouth, figuring that his first taste of wine should be a really, really good wine. I mean, what, you know, it's just a part of that. It was a very different understanding I had of the situation and letting have sips and all that sort of stuff. But it's in, it's really clear in the research when you are um, a family that says no, you know, until you're 21 or whatever the legal age is in your area. Um, that's just not something we do. And not just because I said so, or not just because some arbitrary lawmaker said so. It's because of these things that are happening in your brain. And that's the big difference is we can't just say, because I said so, because that taps into all of the oppositional defiant, but I'm gonna do it anyway, because you said I couldn't do it. Kids need to know the why. And that's why all of the really good substance abuse prevention programs are all about the why and not the scared straight, just because I said so, just say no sort of stuff. That stuff doesn't work. We know that doesn't work. In some cases, it increases the risk that kids will try drugs and alcohol afterwards. And shocking, 50, only 57% of schools in this country have a good substance, have a substance use prevention, pro, sorry, substance use disorder or substance abuse prevention or whatever you want to call it program in their schools. And of that 57%, only 10% are evidence-based. So we can be doing so much more at schools and helping giving parents the ammunition they need in order to understand what works and doesn't work. And sharing that information with home is like a built-in here parents, here's your parenting how-to around talking to kids about these high-risk behaviors. And the cool thing is inoculation theory shows that when you give kids ways to, um, ways to say, I don't want to say no to, to, um, counteract to counter um, like, oh, everybody's doing it or it's no big deal or whatever. When we give kids ammunition for that and they know that they have it, it doesn't just protect them against substance use disorder. It protects them against other high-risk behaviors as well, early sex, things like that. And 
they're generalizable. I mean, that's what's so cool about this. When we give kids ammunition to help them with some risky behaviors, it helps them with lots of others as well. So um, there's a lot that we can be doing that we haven't. And you asked about prevention specifically, and it comes down to that. It comes down to early intervention for the risk factors, which is why it's so important to be clear-eyed about those risk factors and not just pretend it's not happening. If your kid is punching other kids, that's a huge risk factor. If your kid is being ostracized at school, that's a huge risk factor. If your kid is failing academically, that's a big risk factor. And you should have to actually deal with those things and talk to the school. Um, and I also, in the book, address the fact that some people have are in a place of privilege when it comes to addressing those behaviors and have access to, to resources and others don't. And I give lots of resources for people who um, may not be able to just go out and hire a therapist for their kid right off the bat. Um, and then adverse childhood experiences. You need to look at your own family and say, do we have substance abuse in the house? Do we have violence in the house? Um, are my kids, you know, divorce and separation, as difficult as it is to talk about that. And I was, the, I kept writing it in the manuscript and kept saying, oh my gosh, people are going to get so mad. But divorce and separation are a big risk factor for substance use disorder. And then there's a whole bunch of other ones that sort of get on added on as secondary things like adoption. And it's not that I'm saying if you adopt a kid, you're going to have an addict on your hands. What I'm saying is if your kid is adopted, you need to be thinking about making sure they're getting the supports that are needed um, in order to help them with the emotions and occasionally the feelings of um, alienation and, and um, abandonment and stuff like that that can happen from divorce, separation, adoption, all these things that um, aren't, there's no blame or shame going on here. There is, here are these things and here's how to help your kid deal with them. I'm trying to come at this from a position of empowerment as someone who's made a lot of mistakes myself. Which is, yeah, so that you make it so easy for people. I think it comes down to like everything with parenting, that connection and relationship and having that, those open conversations right. and making your home a safe place to be vulnerable and share about mm -hmm. things so that when they slip up or they're having struggles with friends or these things are happening, you can help guide them through it. I think that's an underlying yeah. thing. I think a lot of times parents just don't know, you know, what is going on with their child. Right. And, and I think because, um, you know, it's funny, I just was having a conversation with a friend about how, you know, our parents were not raised in homes where they were taught to share about, oh, I'm feeling sad. And this is what mm -hmm. I'm feeling sad about, or I'm feeling angry, or I'm feeling left out, or I'm feeling mm -hmm. lonely. Right. So they were taught to like put on a happy face. Right. Right. And so then we were raised by these parents who, did the best they could, but at least in, I think for many of us, we were not raised to be like very in touch with the hard things that we were right. feeling. We were more like grit through it. And know? not only that, I was raised to, <laughs> I knew addiction was happening in my home. I knew it was happening. I could see it happening. And yet I was being told that what I was seeing and understanding was wrong. And that's gaslighting. And that is the one thing I will not do to my children. Um, I will never tell them that what they are perceiving is wrong. I can talk to them about logic. I can talk to them about evidence, but I cannot tell them that what they are perceiving is incorrect because, um, especially around substance use, because I could tell from 20 paces with the person not facing me, whether they were drunk or not. And that has had, you know, for me, I try to lead with honesty and disclosure and transparency. And that not only means that my kids trust me more, it means that more of our family discussions are rooted in disclosure and trust and transparency. And I, I hope that's been a good thing for them. Well, I'm, I know it has, <laughs> I can just say from afar, because like none of us are perfect and all of us have made mistakes and done things that with our kids and with our lives and everything else, but being able to really talk with our kids and help guide them through their own journey is just mm -hmm. a huge gift that we can give them. Okay, everybody. So this book, obviously you hopefully have heard just from this conversation, how important <laughs> it is that you get this book, because I think it will really resonate with you. And even if you're not concerned about the genetics or anything else, it does, it's deeper than that, because it will also help you with anything else you have 
abuse or any other things that it kind of just gives a blueprint, I think, for talking mm -hmm. about hard things with kids. Yeah. And I also, but just before anyone picks it up, I want to make it really clear. This is book is all about prevention. Um, there are some wonderful books out there about what to do when things have gotten to the point where you need to seek help for your child. And those are in the resources, but I don't I don't want someone to come to this thinking that I'm going to give them all the answers um, for if their kid has a problem. Um, I, you know, there are, like I said, there are wonderful resources for that, but this book is all about prevention and it's all about, um, you know, doing everything that we can do so that when we look back, we don't have to say, oh, I wish I'd thought to do that thing, or I wish I'd thought of that thing. And that's all, you know, I came at the, I wrote this book when my kids were in their teens and I really <laughs> wish I'd written it when they were, I was pregnant with them or something because, but that's just not the way life works. You learn things as you go along and we model for our kids that when we learn new things, we try to do better next time. So that's what I'm trying to do. Yes, indeed. Thank you so much for being on today, Jess. It's just been amazing chatting with you and I'm re-inspired about just how awesome your book is. Thanks so much. Thank you so much. As always, you can find notes, links, and other resources related to today's conversation by visiting my website at sunshine-parenting.com. While you're there, be sure to sign up for my email list so that you don't miss out on any of the great resources I have available for raising thriving kids. If you enjoyed this episode, I'd really appreciate you sharing it with a friend. Please take a moment to give Sunshine Parenting a rating or review on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. Let's end with a quote from my book, Happy Campers. Regardless of the age of your kids or where you and your family currently are on the kindness meter, kindness is something that you can promote and grow at home. And the resulting positive changes in your kids will be well worth the effort. Kindness makes us happier, healthier, better people. I'm Audrey Monkey. Thank you for joining me for the Sunshine Parenting Podcast. Join me again for more conversations about raising kids who become thriving adults. Mm -hmm.